Hello. Among the artifacts that archaeologists study, bone and shell tools don't tend to get quite as much attention as tools made from stone and metal. However, they can be quite important in certain parts of the world and tend to be used in particular contexts where the maker can take advantage of the natural characteristics of the bone or the shell in order to, or in order to fashion an artifact. One of the things they have in common with stone tools is that bone and shell tool manufacture is a reductive kind of technology. By that I mean you fashion the tool by removing material from the raw material that one finds in nature. And in fact, many of the techniques that have been used in order to reduce uh, bone and shell are, are ones that are very similar to what we find with lithic technology, including chipping and flaking and grinding. In today's video, I'm going to briefly introduce the topic of bone and shell tools uh, and put a little bit of emphasis on the fact that the makers take advantage of characteristics that are already built into the shell or bone as they find them. Bone and shell are unusual materials because they consist of both organic and mineral components. The main minerals in bone are calcium phosphate and calcium carbonate but the elements magnesium, fluorine, and iron are also significant inorganic components. The inorganic component of shell is calcium carbonate, generally in the form of calcite, aragonite, or both. This makes shell roughly as hard as limestone, but with more tensile strength. Because bones and shells naturally occur in a wide variety of shapes, they sometimes don't require a great deal of modification in order to become useful tools. For example, toolmakers can take advantage of the elongated shape of many long bones in order to create a great variety of pointed and piercing tools. Sometimes the rounded articular surfaces at one end of a long bone even provides a comfortable handle, reducing the need to make hafts. While some flat or slightly concave bones like scapulae can be useful as shovels, scoops, or spoons with virtually no modification. Unmodified bivalve shells can also make good scoops or spoons, and most kinds of shell can be used for jewelry, pendants, or buttons, often with no more modification than a piercing for suspension. Toolmakers can also take advantage of the fact that some food processing activities, such as marrow extraction and butchering, can cause bone to fragment into many narrow slivers of bone. In the typology of bone points seen here, making many of the points would require only slight modification of the natural slivers, mainly near the tip. But the fact that it sometimes takes so little modification to turn a natural shell or bone into an artifact also poses problems. Namely, it may be difficult to tell whether the modification was done by humans or some natural process. In the case of these Nasarius shells from northern Africa, Francesco Derico and his colleagues sought a way to distinguish shell beads from shells that were merely pierced by natural processes, such as wave action on a beach. They started with the ordinal scale for shell damage that you see here. They then compared the distribution of shells in archaeological assemblages with samples of modern shells from Jerba and fossil shells from Dar es Salaam. The differences between these assemblages show up well in a cumulative frequency graph. As you can see here, the archaeological assemblage is quite different from the other two, with a sudden jump at perforation stage F and smaller increases at stages G, J, and K. These are also stages that could quite plausibly be piercings for beads. We can encounter similar difficulties in identifying ancient musical instruments made from bone, such as whistles made by piercing things like reindeer phalanges. Here the problem stems from the fact that very similar piercings can be made by carnivore gnawing. Accurate identification of prehistoric whistles therefore requires careful comparison to bones that could only have been modified by carnivores. In other cases, toolmakers treated bones like cores in flint napping. However, unlike most lithic reduction, core reduction could include a combination of sawing, incising, splitting, as well as chipping and grinding. A very common class of bone tools includes ones that are pointed at one end, 
to be used as projectile points, awls, or needles. These are often subcircular in cross-section because they take advantage of the natural shape of long bones, but they can also have other cross-sections, especially if they're made from flat bones or are considerably modified by grinding. Other pointed tools are pointed at both ends. In some of these cases, the second point is for insertion into a haft or foreshaft. Notable among such bi-pointed artifacts are harpoon heads, which often have multiple barbs, such as the one seen at right in this slide, or in these examples from Denmark. Other common bone tools are needles for sewing and fish hooks. The examples here nicely illustrate some of the processes involved in making a bone fish hook. The piece at right is a blank made from the cortical bone of a diaphysis with the fish hook roughed out by incision. The piece at left shows the part that was removed from a very similar bone blank, and the middle piece, of course, is a finished fish hook. Bone tools have also been extremely important in pottery manufacture, so much so that even to this day, many of these tools are called potter's ribs. Relatively flat tools serve to help shape the vessel and thin the vessel walls. More pointed tools can be used for piercing the vessel walls as well as for making punctate and incised decoration. And bone tools with toothed edges allow the potter to make combed or punctate decoration. Bone also serves as the material for buttons and toggles. Here we see a blank for button manufacture. The button maker used a tube drill to remove small discs of bone from a flat bone and then drilled piercings so that the disc could be sewn onto clothing. A simpler alternative was to make toggles by piercing one or two holes through small bones like phalanges. Piercing a phalanx only into the medullary cavity rather than all the way through allows it to serve as a simple whistle. And bones were often used as a sort of wind instrument or aerophone. Making multiple piercings along the length of a diaphysis allows the instrument to make multiple notes simply by covering some of the holes with one's fingers. In most of these instruments, the vibration of air is caused simply by the airstream hitting a sharp edge at one end of the instrument, same as in the bone whistles. But in some later instruments, the vibration of air is enhanced by the placement of a reed near the mouthpiece. Among the earliest convincing examples of bone flutes are more than 20 from the Upper Paleolithic site of Isteritz in France. These are all made from the diaphyses of bird bones. Piercing is one of the simplest forms of modifications to shells, and pierced shells are particularly important on Paleolithic sites because they suggest the existence of personal adornment and the social changes that went along with that. Intentional piercings on bivalve shells typically take place at the umbo, most likely for suspension on a necklace or to be sewn onto clothing. There are several ways to make such piercings, although they vary in difficulty and effectiveness. Illustrating with this schematic of a cross-section through a shell's umbo, one way to pierce it would be by drilling from the exterior with something like a flint drill. This would result in a hole that's wider on the exterior than on the interior of the shell, but it also would be relatively difficult to accomplish because the drill is likely to slip off the convex surface of the shell. For that reason, it's generally easier to drill from the inside. This results in a hole that's wider on the inside than on the outside. Another alternative is to begin drilling on the inside until the piercing begins, and then continue drilling from the outside. This results in what archaeologists call a biconical piercing. However, all of those options are still more difficult and time-consuming than this last one, which is to abrade the shell on the outside with a back-and-forth motion against an abrasive material, like a sandstone slab. This results in a flat surface around the hole in the umbo, and a hole with very sharp edges. However, that sharp edge can itself be abraded and worn smooth, either intentionally or over time as it's suspended from a piece of twine. Here I'll demonstrate just how quickly one can make a piercing in the umbo of a bivalve by using that last method. A 
At this stage, the top of the umbo has become flattened. And already we have a serviceable piercing. Some shell tools, such as fish hooks, are a lot more difficult to make, but still take advantage of some of the shapes already present in the shell. Here I'll put on some goggles and attempt to rough out the shape of a fish hook using pressure flaking. I start with some percussion to break the shell in half along a diagonal. Now I'm trying to use pressure flaking along the broken edge, with the idea of making a large notch along this edge. I've never done this before, so I have no idea if it's going to work or not. I've already broken it in a place I didn't intend, leaving me stuck with a smaller fish hook, if I can be successful in making one at all. My idea is to use the natural curvature of the shell's edge as the outer part of the shank and this straighter broken edge as the outer part of the point, and a large notch above that that will eventually become the gape. However, I'm not very skilled at this, or maybe just a bit too impatient, and once again I break the shell in a place I didn't intend. Eventually, I abandon attempt number one and try again with another scallop shell. This time, I decided to take advantage of the scallop's ear, which already angles outward from the shell's edge, as the point of the fish hook, and attempted to make the gape by grinding instead of pressure flaking, using the edge of the grinding stone to make a right-angled notch. This appeared to work a lot better than pressure flaking, but it's very time-consuming, and I wasn't able to finish the fish hook in time for this video. Clearly I'll need a lot more practice if I'm ever going to master making fish hooks from shell. Ivory is not bone and technically refers only to the material in elephant's tusks, which consists mainly of dentine. However, archaeologists often use the term ivory more loosely to refer to the material of the teeth and tusks of sea mammals. Although these materials can be used to make utilitarian items, like toggles and buttons, they've been more important for the production of decorative items, like these walrus tusk scrimshaw items you see here. Simple pieces of shell, bone, and ivory can all be used as inlay in wooden artifacts, such as bowls, boxes, and furniture. But ivory carved in intricate patterns is particularly good for this. Smaller pieces of any of these materials can be glued into shallow recesses in the wood but larger pieces sometimes have to be affixed with bone pins or metal nails, in which case we may see piercings on surviving pieces. The Megiddo ivories are a particularly wonderful example. These were found in a late Bronze Age deposit at the site of Megiddo in Israel. They're most likely a Phoenician manufacture and originally would have been affixed to furniture. As you can see here, some of them are very richly carved and the furniture they adorned would have belonged to people only at the highest levels of society. I know that was a pretty bare bones presentation, no pun intended, on uh, bone and shell tools, partly because I don't have the resources right now to demonstrate properly for you how to make things like shell fish hooks and, uh, and bone arrowheads or, or harpoon points, that sort of thing. I also don't really have the skill set for that. I'm even worse at making those kinds of tools than I am at making stone tools. Uh, but I, I would hope to do a video on that sometime in the future. In the meantime, I'll try to put some links down below to some other YouTube videos that demonstrate at least some of those things for you. You can also have a look at chapter 14 of my book, The Archaeologist's Laboratory, published by Springer, 
if you'd like to learn a bit more about uh, these kinds of tools. And uh, some of the references I cite there are also very useful introductions to either bone tools or shell tools. Thank you, and stay safe.